On this Thursday night, New York State's gun control law struck down. The Supreme Court ruling triggering anger. Today is a disgraceful decision. And relief. My reaction is happiness. The potential domino effects. Ultimatum with a suspended national chief if the Assembly of First Nations is now threatening seeking and destroying hidden lethal weapons. It's definitely challenging. The daunting and dangerous task of demining Ukraine and dogged determination. A clever canine's great escape from a pet hotel. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. The issue of gun control front and center on both sides of the Canada-U.S. border today. The Trudeau government denying any political influence in a mass shooting investigation. We're going to have that in a moment. But first, tomorrow marks one month since the massacre at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. It led to a reckoning in the United States on access to guns. But action is a different thing. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court came down with a ruling that will allow for more guns on the streets of America. Jackson Prosco has the details on today's concealed handgun decision. As gun crimes surge in major U.S. cities, the Supreme Court delivered a blow to gun control efforts, striking down one of the few state restrictions on carrying firearms in public, arguing such laws violate the constitutionally protected right for Americans to bear arms. Shocking absolutely shocking that they have taken away our right to have reasonable restrictions. The court overturned a New York law that limited who could carry concealed weapons. In a 6-3 to three ruling, the conservative majority agreed it was too difficult for ordinary citizens to obtain a license to carry a gun in public. Those of us who have permits, who have gone through the process of permitting, we're the most law-abiding people on the planet. We don't commit any crimes. The decision has big implications in many of America's largest cities. Similar laws in some of the most populous states are now expected to fall. We may go from a situation where very few people carry guns concealed to a situation where many, many people carry guns concealed, and we won't know how many people are out there. Gun control advocates warn the ruling paves the way for legal concealed weapons to flood the streets and could open the door to court challenges of other gun control measures. This is a victory for bad guys with guns and the gun industry, period. Less than a month after the massacre in Uvalde, the high court is seemingly at odds with this moment in the American gun debate. Across the street at the Capitol, lawmakers from both parties reached a vote, rare compromise. The They're set to pass the first the new gun control 34. measures in years. But those bipartisan measures seem unlikely to stem the tide of gun violence in this country, which claimed more than 45,000 lives just last year. To get consensus, Democrats had to walk away from their plans to raise the minimum age to buy an assault rifle, and they gave up on a federal red flag law meant to keep dangerous people from getting their hands on guns. Farah. Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thank you, Jackson. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau repeated claims today that there was no political interference in the investigation of Canada's worst mass shooting. Trudeau says his government had a lot of questions after the 2020 killings in port pique Nova Scotia, but at no point pushed for more information to be released, as a new report seemed to suggest earlier this week. But as Abigail Beeman reports, that hasn't stopped the opposition from pushing for a larger investigation. From the other side of the world, the Prime Minister addressed accusations of political interference bubbling at home. We did not uh, put any uh, undue influence or pressure. We continue to have support, uh, have confidence in the Commissioner. Ultimately, as we know, police make the determination on what information to release and when. Dominating question period, whether the government pressured the RCMP to release information about weapons used in the April 2020 Nova Scotia mass shooting to further the Liberal gun control legislation. Families who lost loved ones in the worst mass shooting in Canadian history want answers. The question is, who's not telling the truth? Why should Canadians believe this minister over that of a well-respected RCMP officer? The government has hit a new low to ram through legislation. So let's take a look back at that gun control legislation. The shooting was April 18th and 19th, 2020. Just 12 days ago, those heinous acts strengthen our resolve 
May 1st, the Liberals announced a ban on more than 1,500 so-called assault-style weapons, and minister after minister raised the shooting. Their families deserve more than thoughts and prayers. Then, a reporter asked why the government was so focused on legal guns when the shooters were illegal. Watch then Public Safety Minister Bill Blair read from his notes. All, the responsibility for, for identifying the weapons that were used in Nova Scotia is with the RCMP and, 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 it's a, and the release of any information pertaining to those uh, is theirs. The type of weapons were not publicly known at that point, but Blair added this. And I can say with some confidence that the two long guns that were involved in that investigation without identifying them are included on today's list. The rest of us would later learn the Prime Minister was briefed on the exact weapons used April 24th, before the gun control announcement. So we know the government had the information it wanted to underline its case for specific measures and made a point to connect the dots. But many questions still remain about how the pieces fell in place. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. The first desperately needed aid shipments are starting to arrive in a remote area of Afghanistan that was hit by a 6.1 magnitude earthquake early Wednesday morning. Food and medical supplies are arriving by helicopter to the Paktika region, where most of the mud-walled buildings were damaged or completely collapsed when a quake hit. It's estimated that more than 1,000 people have died and at least 1,500 were injured, but those numbers are expected to climb. The international aid agencies, which had been operating in Afghanistan, would have been leading the relief efforts, but they largely pulled out of the country last year when the Taliban retook control. Ukraine received a morale boost off the battlefield today, despite Russia making more gains in the Donbass. European Union leaders voted unanimously to approve Ukraine's bid to become a candidate member of the bloc. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says it's a unique and historical moment for his country. But as Redmond Shannon reports, achieving full membership could take years. Ukraine is now formally facing West, cemented as an official candidate for European Union membership along with Moldova and a provisional candidacy for Georgia. There can be no better sign of hope for the citizens of Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia in these troubled times. President Vladimir Zelensky called it a victory for Ukraine. He set the process in motion just days into the war, triggered by Russia's invasion. But eight years ago, the dynamic was the other way around. Then it was Ukraine's European ambitions that preceded Russia's first invasion. Vladimir Putin capitalizing on the political chaos following Kyiv's pro-European Euromaidan protests. Annexing Crimea and backing pro-Russian rebels in the Donbass. Achieving EU membership and its potential economic benefits will take years and just one member state can veto progress as Albania and others know only too well. Let's say the truth. Bulgaria is a disgrace, but it's not simply Bulgaria. The reason is the crooked spirit of the enlargement. It's totally crooked spirit. Ukraine will also need to continue reforms of its justice system and on corruption. Progress on that may even be helped by Russia's invasion, a war that has increased pro-European sentiment across most of Ukraine's political spectrum. Let's put it bluntly, I mean, Ukraine, for Ukraine to survive as a democratic, as an independent state, you know, it has to really align with the European Union. So that is the only solution uh, or the only hope for the country. And Russia knows that. Russia also knows the EU's push to the east is similar to NATO's potential enlargement, with Finland and Sweden formally applying last month. But Ukraine could change the EU fundamentally. It would be the largest country in the bloc by area, but it would have one of its poorest economies. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Rwanda today and visited the Kigali Genocide Memorial as the first official stop on his 10-day international trip. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, is traveling with the PM. And as he reports, with this visit, Trudeau is trying to signal that the African continent remains a foreign policy priority for his government. <laughs> The Kigali Genocide Memorial, a special and somber place. What happened uh, here in Rwanda 28 years ago 
um, resonates not only every day for Rwandans, but resonates around the world as well as something that we all have to be vigilant on. It was a Canadian general, of course, Romeo Dallaire, who was in command of the United Nations mission to Rwanda in the spring of 1994, when the genocide against the minority Tutsis was perpetrated. As many as 800,000 people are believed to have died in that genocide. More than 250,000 are buried at this memorial. All the world countries who could have intervened made mistakes. Uh, and in so doing, refused to give me the resources I needed to prevent, let alone stop it. One of the legacies of the Rwanda genocide was a rethinking of how the world responds to such atrocities. Atrocities now seen in Ukraine, where Russian soldiers are accused of acts of genocide against Ukrainians. I think strategically, uh, there are still some significant lessons to be learned in regards to uh, the protection of human beings, uh, the establishment of human rights, uh, and also the assessment of what is our self-interest. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's memorial visit kicked off three days of events here, where he is trying to show African leaders that the continent continues to be a foreign policy priority of his government. Here in Kigali, the Trudeau government announced it would establish a full high commission in Rwanda and assign a permanent representative to the African Union. In Canada, we'll provide the United Nations World Food Program with an additional $250 million to help counter food insecurity in Africa that Trudeau says is caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That will uh, make a real difference right now, but of course there's more to do. Russia is responsible for the global food crisis we're facing right now. Trudeau wants to hammer home the message that Russia is hurting Africa when he has face-to-face -face meetings with Commonwealth leaders here Friday. Farah. David Aiken in Rwanda's capital. Thank you, David. The World Health Organization is deciding whether to declare monkeypox a global health emergency. The WHO convened its emergency committee today to consider the declaration. It's the organization's highest level of alert. So it means the UN Health Agency considers the outbreak an extraordinary event that would potentially require a coordinated international response. Now, many scientists doubt the declaration would make a difference since developed nations with recorded cases are already moving to shut it down. Monkeypox has sickened people for decades in Central and West Africa. To date, more than 1,000 monkeypox cases have been reported in non-endemic countries, and so far, no deaths. The Pope's Canadian visit confirmed. Coming up, where his trip will be and his first stop. Despite ongoing mobility issues, Pope Francis will make his long-awaited visit to Canada this summer, where he plans to further apologize for the Catholic Church's role in the residential school system. The Vatican has released a detailed itinerary for the pontiff's five-day tour, which begins in Edmonton on July 24th. The Pope will visit the site of a former residential school in Alberta, will meet with survivors, and celebrate Mass at Commonwealth Stadium. He will then travel to Quebec City to meet Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Governor General Mary Simon before making a final stop in Iqaluit. National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations Roseanne Archibald says her suspension is unlawful and unless it's lifted, she's going to take legal action. Archibald issuing a statement online saying regional chiefs on the AFN Executive Committee do not have the power to suspend a national chief and that the only way to remove a national chief is for the Confederacy of Nations to call a special assembly for that purpose. Archibald was suspended last week after complaints of bullying were made against her. Allegations she denies. The federal government is moving closer to creating a national council to monitor the progress of Indigenous reconciliation in Canada. Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller tabled Bill C-29, which would establish an independent, nonpartisan group to report annually on the progress being made toward reconciliation. The council will be made up of at least two-thirds Indigenous members and was a direct recommendation of the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The Liberal government included more than $120 million for it in the 2019 budget. Hockey Canada says it needs to do more to build a safer culture in the sport. The statement follows the federal government's move to freeze public funding in response to its handling of an alleged sexual assault and out-of-court settlement. 
It says Hockey Canada is deeply committed and actively working to foster a culture in our sport where everyone involved feels safe and of which all Canadians can feel proud. Ottawa says taxpayer money will be restored once Hockey Canada discloses recommendations made by a third-party law firm hired to investigate the alleged incident involving eight players four years ago. A dramatic rescue to show you tonight. This is from the Swimming World Championships. American artistic swimmer Anita Alvarez fainted while performing her solo free routine on Wednesday. Now, her coach, Andrea Fuentes, quickly jumped in the water to rescue the two-time Olympian. Alvarez was given medical attention beside the pool before being taken away on a stretcher. I do remember, like, the very last arm I did, um, I gave, like, it's such a simple, small arm, but I was like, give everything until the very end, and I did that, and then I remember going down and just being, like, kind of like, uh-oh, like, I don't feel too great, um, and that's literally the last thing I remember, actually. Despite the frightening incident, Alvarez says she can't wait to get back in the pool. Ukraine's mine hunter is ahead. The vast and deadly consequences if volunteers miss a spot. It's one of the most dangerous jobs imaginable. Finding and disarming the thousands of landmines now littering Ukraine. Jeff Semple met with one team working to demine parts of the country, a process that's expected to take decades to complete. On the outskirts of the Ukrainian capital, the cleanup has barely begun. In neighborhoods once controlled by Russian forces, residents are returning to pick up the pieces. But lurking in the rubble, a lingering danger. After four months of war, Ukraine is littered with landmines, bombs and other explosives. Remnants of Russian rockets, along with booby traps deliberately set. This area was was all Russian positions. This British Army veteran is part of a team of foreign volunteers working alongside Ukrainian police to safely remove and destroy unexploded ordnance. And they've got their work cut out. And this is just a small fraction of what they've recovered so far. Quite a wide range of explosive devices brought here to this secret warehouse from anti-tank mines to mortar shells to missiles. 85,000 pieces recovered. The team has found explosives hidden in homes, playgrounds, cemeteries, even underwater. Some, like these cluster submunitions, are so sensitive, even a change in temperature can trigger an explosion. A lot of civilians, they'll, if they find artillery shells or something in their house, they'll move them, put them at the side of the road. They do that with a submunition and they're detonating because they're just so volatile. Dozens of Ukrainian civilians have already been killed. Most are agricultural workers, like Vadim Shvidshinko. I drove past here a couple of days ago and I was fine, he says. But the second time through, his truck hit an anti-tank mine. Incredibly, he escaped with minor injuries. This area was marked as dangerous, but farmers are now forced to risk their lives or their livelihoods. The agricultural companies that rent, lease the land here are under huge pressure to generate food. Uh, and that's, that's basically driving them. Um, so people are taking risks. The nonprofit group The Halo Trust has been demining Ukraine since 2014, after Russian-backed separatists first attacked the east. The team had just finished clearing the city of Mariupol when Russia invaded. It's definitely challenging, especially when the conflict is still ongoing. The Halo Trust is one of few organizations willing to operate in an active war zone and they recently received $2 million from the Canadian government. Canada was the first country, the first new donor to respond to our call. It will be a challenge and it will continue to be a challenge for many, many years for Ukraine. Officials estimate that 300,000 square kilometers will need to be cleared, an area the size of Newfoundland and Labrador that grows larger as the war drags on. Experts predict it will take not years, but decades before these neighborhoods are finally safe. Jeff Semple, Global News. Next, a homesick hound's navigational feat that left his owners scratching their heads.
Once a year, the winner of the Westminster Dog Show prances their way into the hearts of the public. But those prize-winning pups are being overshadowed this year by a dog from Kansas. And no, it's not Toto. Mike Drolet reports. The tail carriage going away. They're all so prim and proper at the Westminster Dog Show. For media, it's low-hanging uh, fruit. For days, they run their odd little runs onto every newscast. But hold your chew toy. This year, they're losing screen time. To a mutt from Kansas. This is Dexter, the loving family pet of Jeremy and Sarah Henson. Well, a few months ago, the Hensons went to Las Vegas. Dexter was sent to a dog hotel. On the third day, the Hensons' video doorbell alerted them to a visitor, Dexter. Hi, buddy. Good boy, stay there. Sit. As it turns out, Sit. Dexter had escaped his hotel Sit. by jumping over a two-meter fence sorry. before running Sit. three kilometers home. What a smart boy, though. Good boy. So how did Dexter, who is safe and sound, find his way? Well, a recent study out of the Czech Republic hooked up cameras and GPS tractors to a bunch of dogs and let them run. And while 60% used their powerful noses to retrace their route home, what amazed researchers was that a third of the dogs would first orient themselves along a strict north-south axis before taking a new path home. So they now believe dogs are somehow capable of using the Earth's magnetic field for navigation. Pretty cool, huh? Oh, hello, sweeties. Look, there's no denying the cuteness or practicality of these so-called ambassador dogs calming air travelers at the Kelowna airport. The bloodhound. And a bloodhound winning best in show at Westminster is certainly newsworthy. Good boy, here comes some light. But this week, Good a mutt boy. named Dexter is stealing the show. Mike Drillay, Global News, Toronto. And that's it for Global National for this Thursday night. I'm Farah Nasser. On behalf of our whole crew, thanks so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is Lake Louise in Banff National Park, Alberta. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and each other.